In the last episode, we had looked at reserved constituencies. We had looked at free and fair elections. Not only that, the right to contest, and of course, the right to vote, the universal adult suffrage. In this episode, we will look at the election commission, the function and composition, and of course, something else that I kept a secret in the last episode, that is electoral reforms. So first let us study a bit about the election commission. The election commission, as I told you, is a constitutional body, which is laid down in article 324, clause one, and it is entrusted with what? With superintendence, direction, and control of two things. First, the preparation of electoral rolls. A single electoral roll is prepared for Lok Sabha and Vidhan Sabha elections. So it is entrusted first and foremost with the preparation of electoral rolls. And second, entrusted with the actual conduct of elections to parliament, to state legislatures, and to the officers of president and vice president of India, not to the local bodies. This you must remember. So elections, where? Elections at what levels? Does the election commission conduct parliament, state legislatures? Parliament means both Lok Sabha and Raj Sabha, state legislatures, and the offices of president and vice president of India. The election commission not only does that, it has other important functions. These are the two broad functions that I talked about just now. The other important functions are, it decides on the election schedule for general, state, and by-elections. I talked about by-elections in the end in the last episode. So for general elections, state elections, and by-elections. When nominations can be filed, when they can be withdrawn, last date of withdrawal. So the election commission gives out notification, when counting is to be done, when are results to be declared, all these things, all the dates, the relevant dates for an election are decided by the election commission. Not only that, for the sake of free and fair elections, it can postpone or cancel election, the election process in either the whole of India or any part of India, any region of India. And not only that, the election commission recognizes the various political parties. You know that there are certain parties which are national level parties, all India parties, certain parties which are state level or regional parties. So it recognizes those parties and it allots the election symbols to the various parties. And the election symbols allotted are allotted not only to parties, but to candidates who don't belong to parties. In other words, independent candidates. And the parties that exist, that contest, they may or may not like the symbols allotted to them. That's a different issue. But the election symbols are allotted. This function is performed by the election commission. And then there is a model code of conduct that the election commission issues. And not only does it issue the model code of conduct, it enforces 
that model code of conduct. And that code of conduct is for the contesting parties and the candidates to follow. And the election commission sees to it, ensures that the parties and the candidates of the various parties and candidates who don't belong to parties follow that model code of conduct. They adhere to that model code of conduct. Not only that, as you know that in every state there is a representative of, if, I'm, if I may use the word, a representative of the election commission it is known as the chief electoral officer. The election commission appoints one of the officers of the state government or the union territory as the chief electoral officer. If it is a state or a union territory, whatever it is, it has to have a chief electoral officer as a representative of the election commission and the election commission appoints an officer of the state government or the government of the Indian territory as the chief electoral officer. And most important thing that the election commission it enjoys insulation from executive inf in interference in its functions. What does it mean? That the executive meaning the executive government, the council of ministers and the officers under the government, the bureaucrats cannot interfere in the functioning and the decisions of the election commission. That is known as insulation from executive interference. So what is the composition of the election commission? Article 324 clause 2 says that there must be a chief election commissioner within the election commission and such number of other election commissioners as the president may from time to time decide. The number of commissioners may vary. Now if the election commission is a multi-member body, for a very long period it was a single member body, now it is a multi-member body. Now if it is a multi-member body, then article 324 clause 3 says that the chief election commissioner, the CEC, shall act as the chairman of the election commission and decision is to be taken by the majority. An attempt must be made to take decisions through consensus, but if a consensus cannot be reached, then majority decision must prevail. Now who appoints the chief election commissioner? and the other election commissioners. They are appointed by the President of India on the advice of the Union Council of Ministers. Like other appointments, the President of India appoints them and they are appointed up to the age of 65 years or they are appointed for six years, whichever is earlier. If they complete six years or if they complete 65 years, whichever comes earlier, they are to retire after that. And they enjoy the same status and not only they enjoy the same status, the salary and perks that they receive that are made available to them, they must be equivalent to the judges of the Supreme Court of India. So the status is equivalent and the salary and perks that they receive, those are also equivalent to the judges of the Supreme Court of India. So that is the status of the chief election commissioner and the other election commissioners. Now how can the chief election commissioner be removed? He cannot be removed at will. The executive government may not like certain decisions of the chief election commissioner. So the executive government gets into a conflict with the CEC and tries to remove him or her. That cannot happen. 
that cannot happen. The Chief Election Commissioner can be removed by the President of India only after he or she has been impeached by Parliament. In other words, the impeachment is, rec is recommended by both houses through a special majority of two-thirds of members present and voting. So if that thing does not happen, if Parliament has not impeached the Chief Election Commissioner, he or she cannot be removed by the President of India. But the other election commissioners, they can be removed by the President only on the recommendation of the Chief Election Commissioner. They cannot be removed by the executive government just like that. If they have to be removed, they have to be removed on the recommendation of the CEC. So I told you about the elections to the local bodies, the municipalities, the corporations, and the panchayats not being conducted by the election commission. At one point of time, they were. But by the Constitution 73rd Amendment of 1992 and the Constitution 74th Amendment of the same year, it established state election commissions in all states. For what? For the same reason that the election commission itself exists, for the superintendence, direction, and control of those two important things. One, the preparation of electoral rules and the conduct of elections to the panchayats and municipalities. Municipalities meaning municipalities and corporations as well. So state election commissions are separate bodies that exist in the various states. And different from the election commission, the state election commissions are statutory bodies. They have been created by statute, whereas the election commission is a constitutional body. So in the end, in closing, we will talk about a very important aspect of elections in India, known as electoral reforms. Because we have seen that no system can be without a flaw. No system can be perfect, and a system operated by human beings can not always be perfect. So electoral reforms have been talked about for a long time. But from the 1990s onwards, a lot of committees were formed to look into electoral reforms. The names of some committees you must know committees involved with the task of suggesting electoral reforms. But then I will tell you about certain electoral reforms, some of which have already been carried out, some of which are yet to be carried out, they have been suggested. Your task as students after studying the entire chapter on election and representation, apart from the other tasks that you will perform as given in your textbook, you must find out which electoral reforms have already been carried out and which electoral reforms are yet to be carried out. So I will read for your convenience what these electoral reforms are. First. The lowering of the voting age from 21 to 18 years. Introduction of voter identity cards. Introduction of electronic voting machines or EVMs. Every candidate required to declare his or her assets, liabilities, pending criminal cases against them, and educational qualifications. Then increase in security deposit. Limitation in the number of constituencies from which a candidate can fight election to one. Then limits on campaign expenditure and 
compulsory auditing of accounts of political parties, ban on exit polls and opinion polls, state funding of elections, the provision of NOTA, NOTA, none of the above in the ballot, ban on use of official machinery by candidates seeking, especially those candidates who are seeking re-election, ban on appeals on communal and caste lines, ban on advertisements in print media and door-to-door -door campaign 48 hours prior to the closing of poll and restriction on government advertisements prior to elections. So among these, certain election re reforms have been carried out, certain have been suggested, they have not been carried out, some people say they are difficult to carry out, to carry out. But one which I have not mentioned here, I mention now, that exists in a particular country, you must find out the name of that country. There is a fine for not voting in an election. In India, many people don't vote, they are indifferent. On election day, they don't, they couldn't care less. This time there was a high percentage of voting, but then not always. There are still, there are many people who don't vote. And that cuts across age, that cuts across region, that cuts across income, that cuts across educational background. But then, there is a country that imposes, that, that's a democratic country, of course, which has popular elections and proper elections, not farcical elections as in communist countries. That country imposes fines for not voting. Find out the name of that country. So I hope that this was helpful to you in learning not only about the election process and the phenomenon of representation of India, but in great detail about the election commission and electoral reforms. Thank you so very much. Thank you.